This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. On today's show, did you know that Democratic bosses made FDR accept Harry Truman as vice president? Did you know that Truman was very anti-Semitic and racist? Did you know that Japan did not surrender primarily because of the atom bomb? These are parts of The Untold History of the United States, a book and Showtime series co-authored by Oliver Stone and our guest today, Professor Peter Kuznick. Columnist Catherine Poe reviews the Republican version of the DREAM Act and tells us, thankfully, it has no chance of enactment. And Bill Press speaks with tax expert Michael Linden of the Center for American Progress about a solution to the budget and deficit problem. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. A new book and Showtime television series presents an untold story of American history. Co-author Peter Kuznick tells us that Democratic Party bosses, the British and the French, hated FDR's vice president, Henry Wallace, because he was anti-Wall Street and anti-fascist. The result, he says, was the atom bomb and the Cold War. And joining us now on americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Peter Kuznick is a history professor at American University and co-author with Oliver Stone of a book and Showtime series called The Untold History of the United States. Dr. Kuznick is director of the American University Nuclear Studies Institute and writes and speaks frequently about the use of the atomic bomb on Japan. Dr. Peter Kuznick, thanks so much for joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. It's great to be back. Uh, Your book paints as an unsung hero Henry Wallace, vice president under FDR and the Progressive Party presidential nominee in 1948. How do you respond to the evidence that keeps coming up that he was heavily influenced, if not just plain duped, by the Communist Party of the United States acting on behalf of the Soviet Union? Well, that's an old right-wing canard that uh, people have been dealing with for a long time. As Franklin Roosevelt said, no man was more of the American soil than Henry Wallace. <clears throat> he comes from a long-standing farm family from uh, from Iowa. His grandfather founded Wallace's Farmer, the leading newspaper in the re- in the Midwest. His uh, father was Secretary of Agriculture as a Republican under the Harding and Coolidge administrations, and Wallace was a Republican till the mid '30s. Roosevelt tapped him to be Secretary of Agriculture. And then in 1940, when Roosevelt was running for re-election and knew that we were on the verge of going to war against fascism, he wanted a real progressive on the ticket. So he chose Henry Wallace as his running mate because Wallace was known as the leading uh, opponent of fascism in in the administration, outspoken progressive. But the Democratic Party bosses didn't want Wallace on the ticket. And Roosevelt wrote a remarkable letter in 1940 turning down the Democratic nomination for president. He said, we already have one money-dominated conservative party in the United States, the Republicans. If the Democrats are going to follow the same route, then they have no reason to exist and he has no reason to be the standard bearer. He said, the Democrats have got to stand for progressive, liberal alternatives or else they don't need to exist. And Eleanor Roosevelt went to the floor of the convention and got them to to put Wallace on the ticket so that this didn't, didn't happen, fortunately. But the party bosses wanted to get rid of Wallace in 44 because they realized that Roosevelt wasn't going to survive another term and that Wallace would become the next president if Roosevelt died in office. He was much too progressive for them. Uh, and, but he had enemies who they united against him. And the enemies included the British and the French because Wallace was the leading opponent of imperialism, colonialism in the administration. Uh, it was a Southern segregationist because Wallace was the leading proponent of black rights and civil rights. It was the anti-feminist because he was the leading proponent of women's rights. And it was the Wall Street people. Wallace had decried Wall Street. He said America's fascists are those people who think that the United States comes second and Wall Street comes first. And, and, and so he had his enemies, and they managed to get him off the ticket. But what people don't know is that 
on July 20th, the night that the Democratic Convention opened in Chicago, July 20th, 1944, Gallup released a poll showing that 65% of the American people wanted Wallace on the ticket as vice president. 2% wanted Harry Truman. So the, the, even though the, the uh, convention had been fixed against Wallace by the bosses, in the middle of a big spontaneous demonstration for Wallace, Claude Pepper fought his way to the microphone, senator from Florida. He got within five feet of the microphone uh, at that point, the party bosses prevailed on the chair to adjourn the meeting, even though everybody said no when there was a motion to adjourn. Had, had Pepper gotten five more feet and gotten Wallace's name and nomination, he would have swept the convention that night, been back on the ticket as vice president. On April 12, 1945, when Roosevelt died, he would have become president of the United States. And what Oliver and I argue is there would have been no atomic bombings and very likely no Cold War. All of history would have been fundamentally different. It's a part of history that's not really known, but to us it's a very extraordinary turning point, which shows how close we've often come to having a very different kind of direction in our history than, than we've had, and that different kinds of alternatives are possible, and that change really is possible, and Wallace represented that. He later gets smeared as being a communist because he refused to repudiate the communist support for his presidential campaign in 1948. But if you look at his policies from 44 to 46, when he's vice president and then secretary of commerce, I think that everything he says is right on the mark in terms of under, looking at the world through the eyes of our of our opponents, uh, and especially the Soviet Union, and calling for peaceful competition. He said that the Amer United States and the Soviets, instead of being militarily opposed to each other, should compete peacefully, and that then we'll see which vision works better for the people of the world. Fascinating, uh, the five feet from the microphone and, and how much our, our world could be different. Um, and people don't know this story. In fact, even when I ask my students who was vice president of the United States between 41 and 45, very few of them have even heard of Henry Wallace. And mm -hmm. these are educated kids. Yeah. I'm going to move along here and, and, and ask you kind of your response to critics who say your book and film depict Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union as a victim of U.S. policies leading up to and continuing during World War II. I'd say that they haven't read it or seen seen the the film, the documentaries. Uh, we portray Stalin as a brutal despot within the Soviet Union, somebody who we're very critical of, in addition to what he terrible things he did inside the Soviet Union for destroying the dream of socialism worldwide that we've had to deal with those of us who are on the left in the 20th century. Uh, but was he a victim of U.S. policies? We don't say that. What we say is that the United States tried to destroy the Russian Revolution in its cradle in 1917, 1918, 19. The United States sent uh, over 10,000 troops into the Soviet Union, as did the British and other capitalist nations, and trying to kill it in, it, uh, in the cradle. Uh, that the United States didn't recognize the Soviet Union until 1933, when Roosevelt takes office, that during the war, uh, the United States made promises to the Soviet Union that it didn't keep. One of the big ones that was most consequential from the Soviet standpoint was in June of 1944, uh, Roosevelt asked Molotov, Foreign Minister Molotov, to come to the United States, and Roosevelt publicly promised to open up a second front in Western Europe before the end of 1944. That was before the end of 1942, excuse me, which was so important because the Soviets were fighting off the, the Russians by the, the Germans by themselves. Throughout most of the war, the United States and the British were fighting 10 Nazi divisions combined. The Soviets were up against 200. And, and so they were desperate for U.S. support. Roosevelt wanted to do that. He turned to Marshall uh, and George Marshall and Eisenhower told him, yes, we can open up the Second Front before the end of 1942, but Churchill wanted no part of it, and Churchill sabotaged that. So the United States went off instead into northern Africa and Sicily and protecting the British Empire rather than confronting the Nazis. Marshall was furious. The U.S. policy had been to first confront the Germans and then defeat Japan afterwards. Marshall was so angry with the British over this, what he called periphery pecking, that he uh, he said, we should switch our strategy, screw the British, let's go and then defeat Japan first. 
Eisenhower said that when we invaded Northern Africa, instead of uh, fighting against the Germans, he said this will go down as the blackest day in American history. Mm. So, but, I mean, another part. So, is Stalin a victim of the United States? No, I don't. Wouldn't say that. I would say that American policies were narrow and myopic after the war, especially. When there was a time when we could have collaborated with the Russians. We didn't need this costly and very, very dangerous Cold War. We're speaking with Peter Kuznick, history professor at American University, co-author with Oliver Stone of the book and Showtime's uh, documentary, uh, The Untold History of the United States. You make the startling claim that the U.S. dropped the atomic bomb when Japan was already willing to surrender and that we did it really as a warning to the Soviet Union. Why don't most other historians agree with this analysis? Well, I, I would uh, question the premise of your question, uh, of uh, your question there, because uh, an increasing number of historians do agree with that analysis. In fact, there's a very big difference between the way university historians understand what happened in World War II and the way it's taught to the general public. What people don't realize was that six of the um, United States seven five-star generals and admirals who won their fifth star during the war, have been uh, uh, opposed the atomic bombing, or either said it was morally reprehensible or militarily unnecessary. Among those who was most appalled by it was Admiral William Leahy, who was Truman's personal chief of staff, and he chaired the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Eisenhower is on record as saying the same thing. He says, uh, Simpson told me about it at Potsdam. He said, I, I got very depressed, and he asked why, and I said, we were, don't need to do that terrible thing. Well, I hate to see our country be the first to use such a weapon, and the Japanese already defeated and trying to surrender. Douglas MacArthur, who is hardly thought of as a pacifist, MacArthur said in his letter to former President Hoover that the Japanese would have surrendered in May if we had, instead of, you know, the surrender takes place in the middle of August, said they would have surrendered months earlier if the United States had told them they could keep the emperor. So it, 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 one of the big myths in the United States, and it's one that troubles me greatly, and I take students every summer on a study abroad class to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and your listeners can come with us because we take uh, uh, people who are not students at American University also, travel with atomic bomb survivors and Japanese students and professors, but one of the things that people don't realize is what actually forced the Japanese surrender was not the atomic bombing. It was the Soviet invasion, which the United States understood was going to be the case. And our intelligence reports said that for quite some time. Uh, the United States had already shown that it could wipe out Japanese cities. We've been firebombing Japanese cities. We firebombed over 100 Japanese cities prior to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the destruction reached 99.5% in the city of Toyama. So to the Japanese, the, whether it was one plane and one bomb or 200 planes and 10,000 bombs didn't make a big difference. We had already been wiping out cities. What was new was the Soviet invasion. When the Soviets invaded on midnight on August 8th, the morning of August 9th, the night the day we dropped our second bomb, the Nagasaki bomb, uh, that changed the equation for two ways. One, first, diplomatically. The Japanese strategy for getting better surrender terms was try to get the Soviet Union to intervene on their behalf with the United States. And get, they were giving the, promising the Soviets concessions in, in return. That was their diplomatic strategy. Their military strategy was to welcome a U.S. invasion. They even guessed it was going to come in Kyushu. And uh, they inflict such heavy damages and casualties that the Americans would give them better surrender terms. Once the Soviets invaded, that destroyed both their diplomatic and their military strategy. And uh, as the uh, Prime Minister Suzuki was asked, he said, why are we in such a rush to surrender? And Suzuki says, the Russians are, become, are going to be in, they've taken over Manchuria, they're going to be in the Kurils, they're going to be in South Sakhalin, they next be on Hokkaido, that will destroy the basis of the Japanese state. It says we have a better chance if we surrender to the Americans. That's wow. what forced it. It was not what most people think, the atomic bomb. Hmm. Um, again, the book is The Untold History of the United States, and we're, we're getting a new lesson in, in U.S. history here today, uh, courtesy of Peter Kuznick, co-author. Now, in, in your book, you say that FDR was against the creation of a Jewish state in the Middle East, and that Harry Truman said, quote, he had no use, close quote, for the Jews. If that's true, how did Israel come to exist, and do you believe it had a right to exist? 
Uh, well, I, I, again, I would uh, qualify your characterization on that. Roosevelt was ambivalent. He went back and forth. He did promise the Saudi leaders that the United States would not create a Jewish state there, but he had made alternate, different kinds of promises before that. So I, I would say he was ambivalent at that point. Um, most of Truman's advisors uh, were opposed to creating a Jewish state there, and that was because they all thought that Sa uh, that Saudi oil uh, was so important. Not not all of them. Some of them uh, supported creating a Jewish state. Truman was. It, it's hard to know what Truman's motivation was. If you read Henry Wallace's diaries on this. Uh, Wallace said on a number of occasions that Truman said, we're not going to be motivated by political considerations. We're going to do the right thing. And and because uh, politically, Marshall, for example, told Truman outright, if you recognize uh, is a separate Israeli state, Marshall says, I'm not going to vote for you in the 1948 elections. Truman did his calculations, though, and he said at one point, uh, and it was a very close election, as you know, which Truman was, uh, people thought he was going to lose to Dewey in 1948. Truman asked how many votes the Arabs can deliver. He, you know, he said basically that the Jews are an influential group, the Arabs are not. So sometimes he said we're going to act on principle. Sometimes he said we're going to act out of political motivations. We do know he was very anti-Semitic. We know he was racist. According to his biographer, Merle Miller, in private, he never used any word to describe African-Americans other than niggers. Uh, we know that he was, had a lot of racism toward the Chinese and Japanese, and we know he referred to the Jews always, uh, usually as kikes. I, I mean, I wrote a, an op-ed about this once when we discovered his 1947 missing diary. Uh, very anti-Semitic. However, he was acting, I think, in large part on principle in establishing and recognizing the Jewish state. But there were other considerations. One was that the Soviet Union was also very closely, uh, was a lot, big supporter of Israel at that point. And the Soviets were providing most of the arms, the Soviets and the Czechs, for the Jewish resistance against the Arabs. The big debate was not whether to create a state there, but whether it was to create one state that included both the Palestinians or the Arabs and the Jews. Uh, but, you know, this is a very tough time. And, and you ask, uh, do I think that Israel has a right to exist? I think you should read that part of our book. Uh, we're, we're very even-handed on this. In fact, some people on the left are critical of us because we're not more critical of Israel. Uh, and I mean, we, uh, we think that Israel certainly had a right to exist. But we understand, and after the Holocaust, I mean, most of my relatives were killed in the Holocaust. I wasn't born yet, but this was the first lesson I grew up with in terms of politics and morality was not uh, allowing that kind of um, discrimination and prejudice and, you know, and, and wrongdoing to go unpunished. And uh, so this is a very important issue to Oliver and to me. And we think that Israel is certainly had a right to exist, but we can also understand from the Palestinian perspective and the Arab perspective why they would feel like they were being uh, the burden was on them when it was the Europeans who had actually been responsible for the slaughter, the massacre of the Jews and the Holocaust. So we can understand it from the standpoint of the Israelis and why they wanted a state and why they many of them wanted one in Palestine in that area. We can also understand it from the standpoint of the Arabs and the Palestinians. So it's one of those very, very difficult and complicated questions. Okay. Peter Kuznick, history professor at American University, co-author with Oliver Stone of the book and Showtime series called The Untold History of the United States. Peter, thank you so much for your time with us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We appreciate it and hope we can talk to you again soon. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. 
Catherine Poe, one of our regular contributors and a columnist for the Washington Times Communities blog, explains what the GOP is up to on immigration reform and why it isn't going anywhere. But right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. John Boehner is in a hot huff, fuming so furiously that he'd be red-faced were it not for that eerie orange-toned tan that he constantly has. The Republican House Speaker is angry that President Obama won't play Boehner ball with him in their ongoing altercation over ways to reduce the federal deficit. The GOP leader's pitch to Obama is that the deficit hole should be filled by cutting government spending and eliminating some tax deductions, not most emphatically not, by increasing taxes on corporations and the rich, even by so little as a dime. But this is an EFAS pitch, a soccer ball. The trick is that Boehner and company want Democrats and the general public to agree to massive cuts without telling us which programs and deductions they would sacrifice. So far, Obama is refusing to go for this game of Boehner ball, instead standing firm and calmly saying to him, if you want to spare the rich any burden and only cut back on regular folks, don't expect me to do your dirty work for you. Make your pitch and take political responsibility for the pain you would cause. Oh, the huffing and puffing that ensued. We've put a serious offer on the table, wailed Boehner to the right-wing friendlies interviewing him on Fox TV. Only he hadn't. Not one specific cut had been named. So Obama still refused to be suckered into playing Boehner's game. This is Jim Hightower saying, with polls showing rising public scorn for his pitiful performance, Boehner has finally been forced to try another pitch. But even with a do-over, he balked. His latest proposal cuts $1.2 trillion from federal programs and eliminates $800 billion in tax exemptions, but still doesn't tell us which ones. As Casey Stengel asked the players of a terrible ball club he once managed, can't anyone here play this game? Hightower's commentaries are brought to you by the Hightower Lowdown, the monthly newsletter with Hightower's take on what Wall Street and Washington are up to. For information, visit HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Some Senate Republicans are offering an alternative to the DREAM Act as a way of loosening immigration restrictions. Regular contributor and columnist Catherine Poe says it not only fails to lead to citizenship, it fails to have any chance of passage. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Catherine Poe writes the ad lib blog for the Washington Times Communities. She's a former president of Long Island NOW, and she was selected by Progressive Maryland as one of the top progressives in the state, along with Senator Barbara Mikulski and Congresswoman Donna Edwards. Catherine Poe, always nice to speak with you again, and welcome to AmericasDemocrats.org. It's my pleasure to be back. Thank you. Now, you've written quite a bit and spoken with us in the past about the topic of immigration. Now that Republicans realize that they have problems with Latino voters, among others, they've introduced their version of the DREAM Act, and they call it the ACHIEVE Act. Tell us what the GOP has in mind here. Okay. Well, it's, it's in many ways very similar to the DREAM Act, uh, except it does not allow... Uh, really as a path for citizenship, which the DREAM Act does do. Um, it, uh, it has some changes besides that, uh, such as uh, you have to have been brought here before you were 14. The DREAM Act says before 16. You have to be younger than 29. And, all right, then it says uh, you ha have to have graduated from college or be currently in college to be legal. Only then, after college graduation, and they don't specify whether that includes community college or not. It just says college. Uh, you can apply for a work visa, and uh, which you would have to renew every four years, and you can get a green card. But you're not in line for citizenship. Uh, and the, uh, high school graduates are not eligible. In other words, if you just graduate from high school and decide to go into the workforce, you're not eligible for this. So it, it cuts out a lot, a lot of people. And uh, of course, none of it leads to citizenship. So 
that those are the big, big differences between the DREAM Act and the ACHIEVE Act. So it looks on the surface like it's a good deal until you start to really study the details. Mm-hmm. Now, one element of the Republicans' uh, plan does address an important component of immigration policy, making sure that enough immigrants with science and technology backgrounds can more easily come into the country to work and thus help the economy. What's wrong with that? Uh, that, that sounds good, too. Right. I mean, who doesn't want more right. people here? It sounds good. But with... It does sound good. Yeah, but what's that... wrong with it? <laughs> well, if you look closely, you know, they do say advanced degrees. That means that those 50,000 visas will only be given to people who are going to be taking Ph.D. or master programs in. And like STEM, in case people don't know, means science, technology, engineering and math. That's all. Doesn't it count for anybody else? Those are the only people. And those 50,000 people, those visas would be taken away from the 55,000 that we give every year. So that would only be 5,000 visas left for people who are coming here to uh, just work or people who are just want to come to college. So it actually hurts. Uh, it doesn't really help. Now, STEM was... Um, pushed, believe it or not, or maybe, no, I guess it's not that unbelievable, uh, it was actually pushed by um, high technology firms. Uh, they are the ones that wanted, particularly the ones out in California. So uh, Democratic representatives out there had a lot of problems voting against this, but they felt, you know, that because it pulls away from the general pool and it kills the diversity uh, element that we have wanted, and that's what we've always had here with that pool, because it's a lottery you, in other words, there's no one country that gets special favors, no one class of people. And this sort of, pitch, uh, sort of uh, pitches uh, class against class here with yeah. this. So th- that's why the STEM sounds good. By the way, it was uh, introduced last Friday in the House, and it passed, uh, 245 to 139 Republicans, 245 by party lines. Uh, it will not go anywhere in the Senate. Uh, nobody expects it to go anywhere because, again, uh, it just seems like it's a, another class warfare piece that the Republicans are pushing. Well, so what ought to be the path to citizenship for young people who were brought here by their undocumented parents? Right. And, and, and it does seem only fair that since they have not broken any laws yet, true, their parents did, but they didn't. And they have gone through our public school system, graduated from high school here, uh, and, you know, and, and their parents, by the way, to be eligible for the DREAM Act and for the path to citizenship for these children, their parents had to have been filing and paying taxes all along, even though they are undocumented uh, immigrants themselves. Their parents had to have been paying taxes, or they themselves had to be paying taxes. So um, it's, that is the best way. For them, And again, it's not going to help all these young people. Uh, of course, you don't have to go to college. You could be in the military. Anybody who serves two years in the military is fine or has signed up for the selective service uh, is, is eligible. But that, I think the DREAM Act is still the very best way to go. And it has huge support among immigrant groups uh, here that, uh, so that they see it as a, a fair path and not pushing people ahead. It takes them six years, by the way, to get to citizenship. It's not something they get overnight. It mm-hmm. takes six years. They still get it. So nobody's pushing ahead of other people. Right. We're speaking with Catherine Poe, who writes the Ad Lib blog for the Washington Times communities, and talking about the DREAM Act, or the Republican answer to the DREAM Act, the ACHIEVE Act. The Republican alternative requires that those who take advantage of it promise not to ask for federal aid, such as college loans. <laughs> I mean, is it fair or even realistic to, to, to ask that? Um, I, well, it's sort of interesting because the DREAM Act also says you cannot apply for federal aid. All right? You cannot do that. But you can apply for college loans. So in other words, there are other loans that are out there. You could get them. You couldn't necessarily get the Pell Act uh, loan, but you could get all the other loans that are out there and at, and at the state level. So... Uh, it seems that, again, and then I have to look at the immigrant groups that say, okay, yeah, their, their parents could be filing and paying taxes, but uh, we understand uh, we're not going to make an issue out of that, that they're not eligible for federal loans. So you would think that would make it a little bit easier to pass the DREAM Act, uh, and, of course, the CHIEVE Act says no, no loans. You're not eligible. I, so a big difference there. But I, I, I mean, I, I, I get the federal aid part somewhat. I mean, okay, that's fine, but... 
you can't even apply for a college loan. Right, right, right. I mean, supposedly, you know. Of course, you have to understand, if you read this bill, it looks like it was pretty well thrown together at the last minute. And, in fact, the senators themselves don't seem to think it's going anywhere. <laughs> so the three senators who introduced it. So, uh, yes, uh, I don't know if they hadn't thought that out or what, but that's what it says. Mm-hmm. So what are the politics here? Two of the sponsors, uh, Senators Hutchinson and Kyle, have retired. Democrats, they, I mean, they do have 55 votes in the Senate. Is there any reason for Democrats to accept uh, what you call half a loaf? No, n- no, not at all. Um, and uh, even it seems that the Republicans were, in at least these three Republican senators, and that happens to be uh, McCain of Arizona, Kyle of Arizona, and Hutchinson of Texas, were doing this. Uh, I, I, I saw. I. Saw See it maybe as a way of saying right after the election, and that's why it was sort of thrown together sort of hastily, it seems, is saying, uh, look, 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 we do, we do love immigrants. See, we do, even if you're undocumented, we do love you. All right, we, we, you know, think about us next election around. Now, two of them are retiring, of course. Um, Kyle and Hutchinson are both retiring and won't be here after uh, January, and they have all admitted that this will not going anywhere. It won't go anywhere in the lame duck, and they doubt that it will be brought up next time around either. So uh, it's not going to pass. Uh, I, I, I love this that Senator Kyle had to say, though, which <laughs> it's, 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 it's so, uh, I don't know, so insulting, I guess. <laughs> he said, he understood that when he was asked about this, uh, that it's not going anywhere. It wouldn't do anything for anybody, and, you know, especially since it doesn't have that citizenship component. And he said, listen, People can get married. He said, if you get married to an American, you can become a citizen and apply for citizenship. So if they really want to become a citizen, they could do that. And that, to me, is so cynical. I mean, that just shows you what, how, how the thinking is. And this is still from somebody who's from a border state you would think would know better. But that's the mentality that we're dealing with here. Yeah, um, those forced marriages are, are technically illegal, though. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's, yeah, all that small technicality, yeah. right? Well, of course, they would say we're not forced. This was this was a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> right. <laughs> I I love uh, old what's his name. Yeah, you know. What, oh my goodness. Um, there are about eleven or twelve million undocumented undocumented workers in the country, and the Republican bill would affect only about a million or so. Now, do you think right. that's because Republicans are afraid that every immigrant who can take advantage of reform will vote Democratic? That does seem to be a fear, all right? Uh, and as neither the Chief nor the DREAM Act, of course, address the bigger question, which is those, like you mentioned, the 11, 12 million undocumented immigrants that are here in the country already. Uh, and something really has to be done about this. I don't know whether it's going to be done next four years. I know what President Obama said it would be, but we'll see. Uh, but it's true if you just look at the statistics, in particular, it's the last election. It, it didn't have necessarily have to be Hispanic immigrants. Just immigrants vote Democratic. And it, it's really, if you look at it, it has not so much to do actually even with um, immigration reform, but actually... Uh, they they look at the issues, and particularly when they were interviewing and doing these exit polls, it appeared to be pocketbooks, and they really did believe that Democrats were trying much harder than the Republicans to address that issue. Uh, so actually, the Republicans, if they were smart, should be on board for immigration and, and uh, you know, and, and getting them here as uh, legal immigrants. And, and not being so afraid of where they're going to vote, but start appealing to their pocketbook issues. I mean, they are, everybody is, seems to be pretty conservative that way. So, uh, but we'll see. I, I, I'm not holding out any hope that they will. Because <laughs> right. they're very afraid. They're very afraid. <laughs> well, they haven't shown any signs of it, but it, is, it does seem rather silly to, you, the writing's there on the wall, and yet they, they keep walking away from it. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly what it is. It's right there in front of them. And they still still run for it. So uh, maybe that's why the Republicans will uh, go with the Rubio and think that by having somebody who is uh, Cuban descent uh, will um, uh, you know appeal to the base. I don't know. Hmm. 
Well, yeah. uh, that base of the Democrats, I mean, not, not their Republican base. I don't think that's where the appeal is. <laughs> right, right. Well, we've got a little time to, uh, to watch, the, watch how that one develops. <laughs> Catherine yes, Poe, we do. <laughs> yeah, Catherine Poe writes the ad-lib blog for the Washington Times community and joins us from time to time here on americasdemocrats.org. Catherine, so much, uh, thank you so much for your time with us today, and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Oh, it was my pleasure. Good talking to you. You as well. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, tax expert Michael Linden of the Center for American Progress. As we talk about deadline, 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 uh, joining us uh, from the Center for American Progress with a new proposal on how to resolve our fiscal crisis, Michael Linden is the Director for Tax and Budget Policy at the Center for American Progress. Michael, good to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. A uh, regular team is here, too. And, of course, there's another deadline um, that, uh, is, uh, that, that happens today, and maybe that's the most important deadline, and that is, here we go, one last day, you'll see me as a male model wearing these <laughs> hand-woven scarves by my wife, Carol Press. But Carol tells me this is the deadline if you want to get one of these for a holiday gift for yourself or someone in your family. The last day that she can take your orders and get them out to you in, term, in time for the holidays. So check out our website at BillPressShow.com. Uh, I love the red scarves. They sell very well, too. Um, but uh, there are lots of different colors, different uh, patterns that you can choose from. Go to BillPressShow.com, follow the Click the Carol Scarves, get in touch with her. You guys can do business together, but i uh, got to do it today or can't get there in time for Christmas. So, Michael, uh, on your deadline, yes. um, we, the fiscal cliff, we know when it is, happens January 1. Uh, the president's got his plan. Mm -hmm. The Republicans have you know, sort of, sort sort of, of a plan. plan. <laughs> uh, the Center for American Progress came out with its own this week. Why? You yeah, don't well, think the others are good enough? Well, what we, what we saw as a, a real need was a plan for a comprehensive tax reform, not just nibbling around the edges, but really trying to do something big and bold that would not only raise the revenue that we need, and we absolutely do need to raise revenue, but fix some of the problems in the tax code. Uh, and we, we don't think that that's something that's going to happen in the next three weeks, yeah. but we do think that that's something that's going to happen or could happen over the next year. Uh, and the parameters for that might be agreed upon in the next few weeks. So we really wanted to put that out there and say, listen, here are some really good ideas Okay. How to really fundamentally reshape the country. All right. So, uh, you know, in first two or three points, what is your sure. what would you, what are you proposing in terms of raising that the tax rates for the wealthiest go up? Yeah. Well, what we, else? we so the basic uh, parameters of the plan, uh, the the marginal rates would be similar to the what they were under Bill Clinton, top rate of thirty nine point six, same as what the president's proposed. Yeah. Okay. But underneath that, what we've really done is we've turned a bunch of the deductions, uh, mortgage interest, charitable deduction, item uh, uh, the state and local tax deduction, we've turned those into credits. And the reason we did that is because deductions right now, they actually benefit people who have, make more money than people who make less money. Because if you can deduct money from your taxable income, you actually get a bigger break if you're in a higher tax bracket. Mm -hmm. We don't think that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Turn it into a flat credit so everybody gets the same break. That saves a lot of money for us, and it's a lot more fair. So we've done that. We also get rid of a whole bunch of special tax breaks and special provisions, and we get rid of the alternative minimum tax and phase-outs, all sorts of stuff that makes the, compli the code complicated and makes people feel like the code's unfair because somebody's getting away with something. Now, I should have mentioned um, this came out from the Center for American Progress. Uh, John Podesta, former head of the Center for American Progress, yep. and Neera Tandem, who's the current head, That's right. uh, are certainly part of it. But you brought in some other outside experts and some pretty big names in this, right? Yeah, I mean, we, so. we, had a, we were really fortunate to have a great group uh, uh, 
coming and helping us craft this plan, and it really came from them. People like Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary and former head of the National Economic Council for, for President Obama, Bob Rubin, former Treasury Secretary, Leslie Sam Samuels, who's the former Assistant Secretary for Tax uh, under Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. uh, Roger Altman. I mean, the list goes on. Uh, uh, Bill Daly, who was the Chief of Staff to President Obama, a really great group. Um, and they have enormous expertise, but they also represent – you know, really the folks who balanced the budget last time and yeah. who g gave us the great econ economy of the 90s. So these are people we should listen to. Right. Uh, and John Podesta, of and course. And of course, former, John, John Podesta. Former and, chief of staff. That's for, right. Uh, and for, Neera Tandon were also very intimately involved in the creation now, of this. Uh, so question, can uh, the Republicans assert that we can get all the revenue we need by simply closing loopholes and and some and getting rid of some deductions, they they won't tell us exactly which right. ones they're talking they about, right? <laughs> right. But they, they're always we can get there. We to. don't have to raise tax rates. No, you, there is that uh, any truth to that? No. Look, you could. There is money to be to be had in reforming the code and getting rid of some of these deductions and credits and reforming them. No question about it. But if you just do that, uh, and actually, if you do that and lower the rates as the Republicans have proposed, yeah. you, what you end up doing is cutting taxes for people at the top and raising taxes for people in the middle and the bottom. And that we don't think that's a good approach uh, at all. But what we've done is combined the rates from Clinton with a similar reform. With And we've gone point by point. You can go through and look at it um, if you really want the details. But we've done it in a thoughtful way, not a kind of across the board way. And what the result is is that we get higher taxes from people at the top uh, and l slightly lower taxes for people making less than $100,000. If they do, uh, what do we know about which deductions uh, and loopholes that they're talking about? Is the mortgage interest, everybody says that they've got to eventually get to the mortgage interest deduction. Republicans have been very careful <laughs> about never mentioning which provisions I know, they would go I know, after. But, so uh, so I, I can't tell you what they're thinking, because honestly, what's, I think What's out there? Farm subsidies or oil and gas subsidies? Right. Or? There, there are some things that we that are, should be no-brainers. The oil, oil, tax, oil and gas tax subsidies should be a no-brainer. The special tax break that hedge fund managers get where they get to pretend that they're in carried you know, interest, carried or interest, exactly. That should be a no-brainer. Yeah. But it is true that mortgage interest is something we should be thinking about reforming. Our plan turns it into an 18% credit, which means that if you have $10,000 in mortgage interest, you get an $1,800 tax break. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, right off the bat. Uh, and, and that's true for anybody who has $10,000 in mortgage interest. Today, if you have $10,000 in mortgage, mortgage interest, but you're in the 35% tax bracket, you get a $3,500 credit uh, tax benefit. If you're in the 15% bracket, you only get a $1,500 tax benefit. That doesn't make any sense. So we do that. We phase it in because we know that there's mm -hmm. impacts on the housing market. But that's a good way to go after these things uh, and reform them without getting rid of them entirely. But otherwise, we don't really know the targets. The Republican targets, we don't know at all because they just won't tell us. Now, yesterday uh, at the briefing, Jay Carney and Jason Furman was there from the Economic Council, mm -hmm. too. Uh, I think he's the deputy head of that yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, they, they made an argument, which you just alluded to, and I didn't understand – uh, so maybe you can clarify it this sure, morning. I'll try. We're talking again with Michael Linden, who's the director for tax and budget policy. You talk about a policy wonk. Here he is, right <laughs> here, right here. Uh, the elusive <laughs> policy wonk. We're like Bigfoot. <laughs> the what the argument was made uh, by both Jason Furman and Jay Carney that one of the reasons for letting the h highest rate go all the way up to what it was under Bill Clinton, thirty nine point six, it is that it would make it easier, and I want to say something else, Tom Coburn, the senator from Oklahoma, made the same argument yesterday, mm, yeah. so I heard it twice yesterday, that going back up to 39.6 would make it easier to do full-scale tax reform down the road. Not that far down the road, but let's say you get into 2013, get this little fiscal cliff thing behind us. Right. Why? The real the reason is, and it's the same reason, I, I think Tom Coburn and, 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 and the president have slightly different reasons for it, but the the problem with just doing tax reform when you don't have the rates going back up is that these deductions and credits that we're going to have to go after to and to reform they primarily benefit people at the top but they also benefit middle class families and if you just change those 
then what you end yeah. up doing is is raising taxes on middle class families as well if you to get the same amount of revenue in, in other words if you're trying to get a, a revenue target say let's say 1.6 trillion which is what the president wants yeah. and you try to do that just by reforming the code without the rates you don't touch the rates the only way to do it is to get that money out of the middle class and the president doesn't want to do that and most people don't want to do that uh, but if you let the rates go back up then you're basically halfway to your revenue target and you can get the hmm. rest of the revenue from reforms without hurting lower and middle class people. And when you and the president are talking about reforms, then you're talking about going to credits as yeah, opposed exactly. to... Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about turning some of these deductions into credits. We're talking about getting rid of some of the special set tax breaks that go only to very specific people. We're talking about making this tax code a little simpler for people to, to file under our plan, for example. Uh, 80% of taxpayers would just take a standard credit, a $5,000 standard credit. They wouldn't have to itemize. They wouldn't have to worry about what kind of income comes in and goes out. They would just, their income would be their income. They'd find their tax, co their tax bracket. They'd take a $5,000 credit and they'd be done. And uh, would this include uh, tax advantages for shipping jobs overseas or <laughs> no. uh yeah. we would no we on the corporate side we don't to be fair we don't do a whole lot of specifics on the corporate side we do think that the corporate taxes should go up a little bit um as part of a broader reform but there are also some uh some deductions and some loopholes there that oh absolutely are, there's there's no question there's bad, a lot that's bad, right for reform bad public policy and uh, right for reform michael linden from the center for american progress questions about the way to get from here to there um CAP has put forward its plan. What do you think? 866-55-PRESS. As we go to the break, where can people can check it online at sure. AmericanProgress.org, right? That's exactly right. AmericanProgress.org. You can see the whole plan. I've got this outline here with me this morning. It's the Full Court Press this Thursday, December 6th. We continue when we come back. On your radio. And on Current TV, this is The Bill Press Show. 13 minutes before the top of the hour here, the uh, Full Court Press on a Thursday morning. We're looking uh, still at the fiscal cliff and now a uh, new set of uh, pretty authoritative voices led by the Center for American Progress out with its own plan of how to avoid going over the cliff and also how to get our fiscal house uh, in order. Michael Linden is Director for Tax and Budget Policy at the Center for American Progress. Peter, what's happening online? What are people, uh, social media here? While well, we're talking about, about economy, uh, big, big story that is breaking this morning. Uh -oh. Apple Computers is going to resume manufacturing in the United States. They have all of their products now being built in China, and Tim Cook who replaced Steve Jobs and very rarely gives interviews, gave a couple of interviews this week, one to NBC and one to Bloomberg Business Week, and he announced next year, quoting him, next year we will do one of our existing Mac lines in the United States. So they're going to uh, start creating some jobs here in America. You know, that's a BFD. It is. <laughs> no, it is. Seriously. It's uh, great news. Uh, it's great news, and uh, we knew shortly before he died Steve Jobs was at a very small dinner of uh, high-tech leaders with President Obama uh, in Silicon Valley, and Steve Jobs says, those those jobs are never coming back, Mr. President. Stop talking about it. They ain't coming back. So He, uh, he was wrong, apparently. Tim well, Cook that was, was bringing, his, that was his, back. That yeah. was his policy, and now somebody else is you know, in, in charge. This, well, is, this is going to be building Apple computers. They still are going to be building iPhones and iPads in China, which makes up most of their business, but... This is a very good first step to bring jobs to America from Apple. So, good for them. I wonder where. Hmm. They haven't announced where yet, yeah. so we'll, we'll yeah. have to see. By the way, we are tweeting at BP Show, at BP Show on Twitter. We're talking about the fiscal cliff. Ruth says, I've said for a long time that Republicans are so far to the right that they're falling off the edge. I didn't realize it was actually a cliff that they were up against. <laughs> Mark says, I have my seat belt on and I'm ready to go over the cliff. No, be no deal is better than a BS deal. And Skip says the GOP is on their way to wiping out the remainder of the middle class, ending Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, and home mortgage deductions. Uh, so, Michael, we hear that more and more from, uh, from Democrats, that better to go over the cliff, better no deal than a bad deal. Do you agree? 
Uh, yeah, I do agree. I mean, it, it depends on how bad the deal is. Look, there's a spectrum, right? Well, there's let's a- say the deal. If the deal includes extending the Bush tax cuts for the wealthiest of Americans uh, for another two years. No, that's not, a, that's not a deal worth making. I mean, that's just not a deal worth making. The, the, the fact of the matter is we, we are at a tough spot. We, we are sort of caught between a rock and a hard place. We don't want to go over the cliff. If we can avoid it, I mean... This, the Congressional Budget Office says that we'll have a recession next year if we go over the cliff and stay over the cliff. Even though it's a slope and not a cliff. Yeah, but if, right, and the point is, that's right, and it's, and it's the idea that if we're on January 1st, there's going to be some kind of explosion. That's really not the case. Yeah. But if we go over and stay over, uh, we will have, uh, there will be negative economic effects. So we'd like to avoid that. On the other hand, we, we've really got to do something about our tax code. I mean, it is just failing. Uh, it's failing at its most basic task, which is raising the money ne- that we need to raise to fund the government. And this idea that it's we also can just failing keep kicking in that the is can. unfairly applied. Oh, absolutely. This uh, this notion that there are. I mean, the the truth is there are. Uh, many millionaires who get away with paying lower taxes. I can think of one off the top of my head. I don't know, uh, Mitt Romney, for example, <laughs> yeah, uh, who right. gets away with paying much lower taxes than middle class people. And that's a failing of the tax code, too. And it's, t- you know, that's an issue that we really do need to address. And this is an opportunity to do that. Kevin's got a question from uh, or a comment from Alloway, New Jersey. Hi, Kevin. Welcome. How you doing? I was hey. just calling about the like you said, like you guys were just starting to talk about the the money that Mitt Romney and Warren Buffett, you know, Warren Buffett's ready to pay it, but Mitt Romney's not. Is there anything in the New Deal that that addresses that situation? Uh, okay, Kevin, good question. Take your answer on the air. So, uh, so in our plan, we would address that situation in a couple of ways. One of the reasons that Mitt Romney is able to get get away with such an incredibly low tax rate is 14 percent yeah he takes almost all of his income in what's known as capital gains it's investment income and right now that's taxed at 15 percent which is basically the same rate that middle income people pay under our plan the, that same income would be taxed at 28 percent that's the same rate that was signed into law by ronald reagan in 1986 we had mm. it through the 90s uh, that's a reasonable rate for that capital income and that would basically ensure that people like mitt romney are not able to pay extraordinarily low rates on their on their on their income and we have to remember that this is classically called unearned income yeah, it's, it's money that they really do not work for so uh, that that's another failure of the tax code to me is that people that really bust their butt, right? Right. And work up a sweat. Right. And have to take a shower when they get home from work. Uh, they pay a higher rate on that income, a much higher rate on the income, than people who just sit home and clip their coupons. That's absolutely right. And there's a whole bunch of other loopholes that uh, Mitt Romney has taken advantage of, including stashing money in his IRA and all sorts of things that we would crack down on and really uh, address some of those issues of fairness. And, and that really is a problem. When you're filling out your taxes, you're thinking, how come I'm doing this? I'm sure that there's some rich guy out there getting away with something. And the, the fact is, there are. So it's, a, uh, it's the big debate, the big issue in Washington uh, these days. Again, we've seen uh, the uh, outline from the, of the, where the president wants to go, where Republicans want to go. Now we've got a new player here, the Center for American Progress. And you can check out their uh, proposal at AmericanProgress.org. Michael Linden, thanks for coming in today. Thank you so much for having right. me. Thanks for all your uh, good hard work and for keeping it uh, easy, <laughs> at least easy for somebody like me who failed math to understand. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Peter Kuznick, Catherine Poe, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For americasdemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go 